Uh, so today we are going to finish talking a little bit about antibody structure and function um, and uh, then move into um, this issue of generation of antibody diversity. We left off last time talking about the different antibody isotypes and the things that are unique about different isotypes. We had specifically talked about IgM, IgD, IgE, and IgA. Um, and we're in the midst of talking about IgG. Um, so when I think about IgG, um, I am first of all um, really smushing together a bunch of uh, different subclasses of IgG. Um, but one of the things that is really unique about IgG is that its serum level is the highest of any of the different isotypes. And you can see that being really true for IgG1, but you can also see that if we were to take a sum of all of the IgG isotypes, um, IgG is way higher uh, than the other isotypes. Um, part of that is because it has a much longer serum half-life. Um, the reason why, I, why this is sort of important is in a lot of ways, um, when people want to do antibody measurements, they measure IgG. Um, there are certain um, aspects of immune responses that people specifically will do IgG measurements for. It's actually not that uh, IgA or IgE wouldn't also give you the information that you want. It's just there's so much IgG um, that it's the easiest one to measure. Um, and so it's sort of the one that people think about the most often. Um, the subclasses um, have somewhat different functions. They're all great neutralizers. Um, some of them can opsonize. Some of them are the only ones that can sensitize NK cells for um, ADCC. Um, some of them are activating complement. So they're pretty good at many of our different functions. Um, the different IgG subtypes largely vary based on the length of their hinge region, um, as I told you about last time, um, which dramatically uh, changes things like how long they hang out in serum, how easy it is to degrade. You can see that IgG3 has a super long hinge region, and it also is the one that, spends, that sticks around for the most, lowest amount of time, because it's really easy to degrade and have a protease clip that um, extra long region. Uh, when I think about IgG, there are kind of two big functions that I tend to think about. This is one that I've already alluded to today, um, which is that IgG um, tends to be made slightly later in the course of a response. So in the black line, you can see the timing of IgM production. In the red, you can see IgG. IgG is made um, a little bit later in a response, and if you get a, say, second dose of something, a second infection with something, IgG is going to be made really, really, really in uh, great amounts. Um, so seeing an IgG response um, does tend to indicate that we sort of have a mature immune response. Not, you know, if you see IgM, it could be the very beginning. If you see IgG, you know you really got a good immune response going on, and it also tells you that perhaps you're seeing a secondary response um, instead of a primary response. Uh, because IgG, again, IgG is actually not the only isotype that could give you these sorts of indications, but since it is so um, prevalent in the blood, it's the one we measure um, for these types of things. When we talked about IgA last time, I told you that IgA was great at neutralizing, but that usually when I think about IgA, I think about 
um, IgA's anatomic location as being more interesting than any other aspect of IgA. Um, and I told you that IgA has this ability to cross cell uh, layers or tissue layers in the body to get into mucosal sites so that we can have IgA um, in the GI tract, in the lungs, um, et cetera, et cetera. IgG also has the ability to cross one particular type of cell wall, cell tissue layer. So it's not found in mucosal sites, but it is found in one specialized place. Um, and that is that IgG can cross the placenta. So um, you can see here, we talked about IgA being in breast milk, which is all the way on the right. You can see the general location of different isotypes on the far left. Um, but IgG is unique in that it is able to cross the placenta. Um, and so um, a fetus in utero is going to have IgG from its mom um, based on the immune responses that its mom has already made. And for a short time, that baby will have um, those antibodies as well. Um, so this happens because the IgG antibodies in maternal blood can bind to a specific receptor and get carried across um, the placenta layer and actually be delivered into the fetal uh, circulation. So we can see direct delivery <coughs> Um, across the placenta, um, specifically across a cell type called the placenta trophoblast, um, from the mom's blood into the fetus's blood. Uh, this is particularly important because before birth, this IgG that is being transferred across the placenta is really the main type of antibody that the baby has. Um, the baby, you can see, starts making its own IgM a bit, particularly as we're getting up towards birth, but really doesn't start making a ton of its own antibodies until at least, say, six-ish months post-birth. So for this early period of time, after the baby is born, the only antibodies that that baby has are the ones that have come from mom through the placenta, or potentially um, some that are coming from mom through breastfeeding. Um, so there are a couple of really important things that actually come from these data. Um, First, I want you to notice, if we look at this pink line of the passively transferred um, maternal IgG, this is just like passive transfer of antibodies that I told you about for treatments last week. So I told you about if you got a black widow spider bite, we could give you some preformed antibodies uh, so that they'd be ready right away. Um, or uh, there are you know, some COVID treatments that have involved giving people preformed antibodies. Here, the baby's getting preformed antibodies from mom through the placenta. And what you'll notice is that those antibodies don't stay present for a long period of time. You can see some of these other situations where the baby's making its own antibodies where the antibody levels are uh, kind of persisting for a while. You can see that the ones um, that are coming from mom through the placenta are not persisting. The reason for this, and this is true of any passively transferred antibody, is that in the case of passive transfer of antibodies, we are transferring just the antibody protein and not actually the cells that are making the antibody. We're not transferring the B cells that are making the antibody. We're just transferring some of the proteins. And those proteins have some half-life and are eventually going to get degraded in the baby. Since the baby doesn't have the cell to make more of those antibodies, um, it's not going to be able to replace them. Here, when the baby's making its own antibodies, 
it's actually doing so with its own B cells, able to uh, make new antibodies. What you will also um, notice is that um, you can see that there is sort of this period of time where the baby is sort of potentially at risk. Um, but you can also realize that uh, because their antibody levels are particularly low. Um, but this also leads to another uh, piece of information. So um, when you look at the childhood vaccine schedule, you see that kids get a lot of vaccines sort of at the sort of three, six month period of time. That's when kids are getting a whole bunch of vaccines. And we, you might wonder, well, why, why then? That timing is actually uh, optimized to be when mom's antibody is almost gone. Because we don't want mom's antibody to kill the vaccine. That would be kind of useless. That would mean that the baby's B cells didn't get a chance to actually do what they needed to do. So you gotta wait long enough for mom's antibodies to be gone, and you've gotta wait till the period of time where the baby's immune response is actually working. But you kinda don't wanna leave the baby unprotected for very long. So it's sort of like you have to find exactly that spot where mom's antibodies are gone, the immune system's ready to go, and you need to actually make sure that you're gonna protect that baby right away. And so that's why the vaccine schedule has so many vaccines happening right at this period of time, because of these uh, observations we've made about the antibodies. Um, there are some infectious diseases that are particularly lethal for infants. Um, the most famous, or one that's particularly famous, is pertussis, or whooping cough, um, because of the cough reflexes that babies have. Um, if, say, you are under a month old and you get pertussis, um, it's largely lethal. Um, and what you can notice is that it's kind of tricky to immunize a baby to have them be protected at two weeks old, or a month old, or something like that. And so a big part of what we have started to do with the public health pr uh, procedures is that we now actually give pregnant women a pertussis vaccine in their third trimester with the idea that that will m ensure that they start making a lot of pertussis antibodies and passing those antibodies through the placenta so that the baby has those pertussis antibodies right away before we're able to actually immunize the baby. Um, and so there are a number of different strategies like this of trying to help infant immune responses by giving moms different types of vaccines um, to help protect babies sort of right from birth from a number of different infectious diseases. Um, that people are studying. Um, but this is a, uh, now a general public health um, part of the way that we deal with pertussis. Um, one bad side to antibody transfer through the placenta is that there are some autoimmune diseases that are mediated by antibodies. So for example, um, there is an autoimmune disease called Graves disease um, where individuals have antibodies um, that um, attack their thyroid. If uh, a pregnant woman were to have Graves' disease, those antibodies can cross into the fetus and start to act on the baby's thyroid. We're, because we're transferring the antibodies and not the B cells, this is going to be a short-term thing. Um, then when those antibodies have degraded, um, the baby will be okay. Um, and fortunately, we now know a lot about how to treat um, this sort of situation. But you can see that um, this uh, could be potentially problematic. Um, it's also kind of evolutionary seems, evolutionarily seems good. Um, if you have a 
you know, a mom has a baby, she probably is having that baby in the area where she grew up, or at least not like across the world in a lot of ways. She's probably, at least, you know, historically in the human population, that baby is probably likely to get the same kind of microbes that she's had in her life, not like a whole different set. So the fact that she's kind of providing some protection is good. You can imagine if a prehistoric woman suddenly moved across the world, um, her baby would not be very protected from her antibodies because there's these different microbes um, that she was seeing than um, that the baby was seeing compared to her. Um, so there is sort of this evolutionary piece to this. Uh, so we have to get into our real issue today, which is the antibody diversity problem. Um, I told you about the Landsteiner experiment where uh, Landsteiner showed that he could get um, animals to make antibodies against these um, organic dyes that had never before been um, made and sort of got this idea that we could get antibodies against anything. Um, immunologists have done a number of different um, experiments um, to come up with these numbers. I'm, the numbers I'm giving you are like approximate numbers. In fact, I know on like a couple different slides the number is slightly different. It doesn't really matter what the exact number is. The thing that matters is sort of the scale of the number. Um, and immunologists have realized that we could make about 10 to the 16th different antibodies. So that means that there are about 10 to the 16th different epitopes that you could recognize. So 10 to the 16th slightly different antibodies. Um, again, these... Um, uh, Antibodies or proteins, these are actually, this estimate was first done in the early 1900s. Um, the numbers were a little different then, but the problem that I'm going to explain to you right now, they, they, they came up with, even if they didn't have the right numbers for the problem. Um, so there's 10 to the 16 different antibodies. Antibodies are proteins. Where do proteins come from? Okay, so we make them on the ribosome. What, what do we use for info about how to make them? DNA. DNA. So in order to get a protein, you have to have a gene that encodes that protein. Yeah? So there should be a gene that goes with proteins? Well, we have, at this point, we've sequenced the human genome. The 10 to 16th antibody protein. We now know that there are two point three times ten to the fourth genes in your genome. Um, so, uh, do you notice any problems here? <laughs> There's no way to encode that many proteins with that many genes. You have way more antibody proteins than you do genes in your genome. In fact, it's not close. That's why the numbers don't actually matter. No matter whose numbers you use from what year, the answer is it's not close. And even I, who really loves the immune system, can't say that every single gene in the genome has to be an antibody. So like, this, this is really far off, and this was a huge problem. Immunologists um, were trying to figure out how to deal with this problem of how do we have that much diversity in our antibodies for about 70 years. In coming up with um, 
this, they had some other observations that they made that influenced some of their uh, ideas about how antibodies are made. So I want to tell you a little bit about these observations. Uh, I'm just going to sort of lay them out as kind of bullet points. I'm not necessarily going to give you the mechanics behind all of them until, say, Wednesday or later. <laughs> um, but one thing that they knew was that antibodies came from B cells. Um, they also knew that um, B cells seem to have a B cell receptor on their surface um, that um, is very similar to an antibody. Um, it's basically just a, an antibody with a transmembrane domain. This actually led one person to come up with this idea that antibodies are just B cell receptors that fall off. Um, they were wrong, but there's a lot of really bad wrong um, hypotheses on this. Um, some of the people who I sometimes go through their hypotheses that are wrong and like make fun of all have won Nobel Prizes for other things, so we don't need to feel bad about them. Um, but one of, so we knew that there was something going on with a B cell. We knew that the B cell receptor has this ability to make a couple different forms of this protein as either the receptor or as um, a secreted uh, protein. And we also knew that um, our B cells all make homogenous receptors. Um, the phenomenon of this um, is known as allelic exclusion. And we're going to, again, see much more about allelic exclusion um, Friday and after break. Uh, so we're going to see a ton more about allelic exclusion, but what you should see, realize about allelic exclusion or the sort of point that I'm trying to make here is that each B cell makes many copies of the same B cell receptor or the same antibody. It's not like this B cell makes 12 different receptors. So here you can see it's got blue and red. It doesn't also have blue and blue, or red and red, or purple, or orange. Every single receptor, B cell receptor on this B cell is identical. It's this blue and red one. Every single antibody made by this B cell is identical. It's, blue, it's this blue and red one. If you want to get a different antibody, one of the other 10 to the 16th, you need a different B cell to be making it. Each B cell is only going to make copies of the identical receptor. We knew, I don't know why I say we, these experiments I'm going to show you are done before I was born. Um, but uh, it was known that the antibody response improved over time. So there was somehow this ability to remember or have memory of previous encounters. So somehow we had, there was something about memory going on here. And there was also this observation, as I told you about last time, that we could have class switching where we could keep the same variable region of an antibody, but switch to a different constant region. So for example, we could switch from an IgM that bound to a particular antibody antigen to an IgG. We can also improve the affinity for um, the uh, antigen. Um, and so all of these observations were um, known for a long period of time and they all went into some of our ideas about how to solve this diversity problem. Um, and a lot, like I said, a lot of scientists had a bunch of ideas about what this answer was. This really did go on for like 70 years. 
in the field. And they came up with these fun ideas about how like antibodies could change their folding and do all these weird things. And they, they came up with all this like stuff that now we know is such wrong biochemistry. But what was actually realized when thinking about things like the ability of the immune response to have memory or the fact that one cell makes one type of receptor was that this couldn't be a, something that was about the cell switching up its proteins. The only way that this could actually work is if there was something going on with, at the DNA level in the cell. Because the cell had to be able to keep that change for a long period of time and send that change to its progeny. Um, and it was realized that something had to be going on in terms of the DNA of these B cells. This eventually led us um, partially to this idea of the clonal selection and clonal expansion theory. These are both adapted versions of these figures. There's another piece of this theory that complicates our lives that I have put white boxes over right now because we don't want to deal with it. Um, but what we realize um, is that there is this process of diversification of our, in this case, B cells, potentially making antibodies, that happen when those cells develop. So you are going to have sort of some original stem cell that's going to start to diversify into a whole bunch of different cells with different receptors different abilities to make uh, different antibodies. Here, you can see two. Here, you can see three. If we were drawing this totally correctly, we would draw 10 to the 16. But I definitely do not know how to draw 10 to the 16. So there's a huge number of diverse cells. Those diverse cells are made when the cells are developing. And they are made basically randomly, and you make one each. So you got one pink one and one blue one, and one red, one yellow, one orange. You are doing this right now. You are developing new B cells. And you are making one each of ones that recognize 10 to the 16 different things. Right now, you have a B cell somewhere hanging out in your body that recognizes Ebola. You got one. If you got Ebola, one wouldn't do very much for you. But if, if that B cell ever meets up with its particular antigen, it divides. It starts to divide and it starts to make a response. And so you can see that it will get sort of selected and told to expand. It will be told, good job, we like you. Make more of yourself. You hope your Ebola B cell never ever sees its match and always stays one in your whole life. But uh, you have already made it. You have already undergone this diversification process. Um, I say this because um, this is one of the most commonly misunderstood things about immunology. I feel like this cannot be said enough because once you actually get that this is how it works, a lot of other things start to fall into place. So we know that this is sort of what's going on. We know that we're going to have something happening in this early cell that allows uh, it to have really diverse progeny. But what we need to talk about is what is the process that's happening in this cell to lead to all of these diverse progeny. 
Um, this slide will help you out later in terms of thinking about the answer. So um, here's our question, how we're getting 10 to the 16th different antibody proteins when our genome only has 2.3 times 10 to the 4th genes? The answer is that we have some strategies of combinatorial diversity and strategies of junctional diversity. Since I have not yet defined either of those for you, this is less than helpful. But when you come back later and are studying for your exam, you'll be like, oh, look at this helpful thing that explains all of it in one spot. Um, you can also see that there are two different pieces of combinatorial diversity, two different pieces of junctional diversity. You won't hear me or see me asking on an exam a whole lot about combinatorial diversity. Um, it's the, the term for stuff that immunologists use. Um, you will sometimes see me asking about junctional diversity. Um, so that's the term that you should recognize more so than combinatorial. Um, and to uh, help you understand combinatorial diversity, I'm going to tell you a little, we're going to have a little scenario. So um, some of you may have noticed um, for a bunch of reasons I've been extraordinarily stressed lately. So let's imagine that because of my terrible stress, I decided I was going to quit this whole science thing and run a restaurant. Um, so that's my, new, that's my new plan. But in running my restaurant, I have a problem. Because I only know how to cook four things. This is not that much of a change. So let's imagine I know how to cook chicken. Which is true. And let's imagine that I know how to cook beef. Okay? And I know how to cook carrots. And I know how to cook broccoli. That's all I know how to cook. I have very little diversity in my recipe, recipe repertoire. If we think about these not as individual dishes, but as pieces we can combine together to make dishes, then we realize that I could have in my restaurant, chicken and carrots, chicken and broccoli, beef and carrots, or beef and broccoli. Okay, great. I, I know how to cook four things, and I got four things on my menu. Like, not helpful. But now let's imagine I learn how to cook one new dish. So I now learn how to cook tomatoes. If I stop thinking about these as individuals and start thinking about combination, suddenly by learning one new dish, combinations differently. If I now learn another new dish, again, I get two more things on my menu. So now I can make potatoes. And I now I don't know how to cook six things, but I'm up to having eight things on my menu. And if I learn how to cook fish, well, now I actually have what is this, seven things that I know how to cook, but I would get up to 16 things on my menu. No, that's all right. I would get 12 things on my menu. Um, 
And so you can see that by taking advantage of combinations of smaller parts, we can add, use a small number of pieces, but get a big number of, component, of final components out of there. That's all combinatorial diversity means, is that we take and pair different smaller pieces together and that helps us get to a larger number of possible antibodies. I've already told you about one aspect of combinatorial diversity. And that was that I told you that for an antibody, we have pairing of a heavy chain and a light chain. And we recognize a specific antigen based on the pairing of the heavy chain and the light chain. And so here we are combining different heavy chains and different light chains. the sort of meat that I was doing here in the heavy chain and the vegetable or starch or what I don't even know what that's coming up with um, as the light chain <laughs> you can see that by coming up with heavy chain and light chain combos I don't need 12 genes I only need seven and we can as the numbers get bigger so as I if I were to go to like 12 things here suddenly the number of combinations would get a lot bigger. Um, so basically, you would multiply together um, 3 times 4. That's how, I got, that's how you get 12. So if I had you know, 10 heavy chains and 10 light chains, that's 20 genes, but it's 100 antibodies I can make. Um, so that's one piece of this combinatorial diversity. That already helps my numbers problems a lot. Scientists made some further observations about antibodies that are shown here. They found that you could have the same constant region paired with different variable regions. So you might imagine the IgD constant region could be paired with a whole bunch of different variable regions. And they could also find examples where the same variable region was paired with different constant regions. And so they sort of thought about it and they said, okay, so we have this idea that combining heavy chains and light chains is going to help us come up with um, new combinations. But what if we actually encoded different parts of these proteins with different genes? What if, we encode, what if we had a gene for just this part of the protein, the variable region part, and a different gene for the constant region part? And we did combinatorial de pairing, we did different kind of pairing of different mini genes in order to encode different proteins. And so they came up with this mini gene hypothesis. Um, and with the mini gene hypothesis, they said that there were multiple different mini genes that could be combined together to make the final gene encoding an antibody. So in this example, you could see there are multiple of these little V regions, multiple of these J regions. You pick one of the Vs, you pick one of the Js, and you make a final DNA sequence encoding an antibody. And so the idea was that it would look something like this. Here you can see there are two different Vs, V1 and V2. 
and two different J's, J1 and J2. And each cell will pick a V and will pick a J and put them together. You can see that this cell in the upper left picked the red V and the yellow J. This cell picked the red V and the orange J. This cell picked the brown V and the yellow J. This cell picked the brown V and the orange J. And so we have four cells, each with a different antibody gene, um, that allows us to have four cells, each with its own receptor. That's unique. Um, and this is happening, this process is ha of sort of mix and match, or this choice process, is happening at the DNA level in that progenitor cell. So what is actually happening is that the cell is picking, and I'm using picking in so many air quotes right now, picking a V, picking a J, and cutting and pasting its DNA to put those two next to each other, and otherwise throwing out the rest of the DNA in that region. So we are getting actual directed cut and paste of the DNA. The cells actively damage their DNA. They break their DNA, they put two new pieces together, they throw out the rest. And each cell is going to do a unique combination to make its heavy chain and a unique combination to make its light chain. Um, so it's gonna go through this whole process, wants to make a heavy chain, wants to make a light chain, then combine those together um, in order to get this to work. Um, in order to um, show for uh, that this would happen. Um, you know, people came up with this idea, I think in like the 60s. Um, they were finally able to show that this was in fact true in the 70s. Um, some of the most important experiments were done by a scientist named Tonegawa. And so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the Tonegawa experiments. Um, one of the things that I am always amused by with the Tonegawa experiment is that Tonegawa is actually still um, actively do, doing science today. Um, he's at MIT, he's actually has a lab, still doing stuff right now. Um, after he did uh, these experiments, um, he declared immunology done and said all the hard problems in immunology were now solved and became a neuroscientist. Um, I don't necessarily agree with him that all the hard problems are solved, but uh, so he now does neuroscience. Um, still actively today, because he figured once he solved this, there was nothing else to solve. Um, so Tonegawa took two different kinds of cells um, from organisms. One kind of cell was a cell that would produce an antibody. Um, so it was a cell that would have already gone through this whole process. And in reality, it was actually a tumor um, because he wanted to be able to get a whole bunch of the exact same cells that made the exact same antibody. Um, you don't need to focus on the tumorness. Just know that he has a ton of B cells making exactly the same antibody. And so these are sort of the cells that are after. They've gone through whatever this magic process is. He also has some cells that he wants to have as the before, that have not yet gone through this process. In some of the different papers working on this problem, they use some different types of cells for the before. Here, you can see he uh, is listed as using embryonic liver cells. So cells from an embryo that maybe haven't gone through whatever this process is yet. Um, a lot of people also would use um, sperm cells with the idea that those are cells where the DNA should be before. Um, and then the antibody producing cells should be after. And they took uh, these two cell types and extracted DNA um, and ran that DNA on a gel. 
They did have to cut with a restriction enzyme just to get DNA pieces of like manageable size. The actual sizes of the bands are less important here. Because it's the, so don't get super hung up on the sizes of the bands. They were just cutting to kind of get manageably sized DNA. Because like full genome sized DNA was too big. And what you can see is that they get all sorts of DNA of all sorts of sizes from either cell type. So now they have all the DNA in a gel. They also have done some other experiments. And they have the mRNA encoding the antibody. And in fact, the antibody that's made by the tumor cells. They have a whole bunch of this mRNA that they've made in the lab. And they have put a label on it. They can now take this labeled mRNA and incubate it with the DNA from their gel. Basically what they're trying to do is find the DNA that matches that mRNA. Whatever DNA encoded for that mRNA will be complementary to it. It will bind up the mRNA, both for hybridization. And when they looked at the before cells, they found, this is, really, this is really the key in Lady 2, they found that this mRNA bound to two different pieces of DNA. A piece of DNA over here and a piece of DNA over here. So it was bound, so in the before, it was bound to two pieces of DNA. It came from two distinct pieces of DNA before it was different pieces of DNA. But after, it only bound to one piece of DNA. So the DNA had moved. We got so what used to be two separate pieces of DNA was now one non-separate piece of DNA. Um, and so this was a big part of proving this mini gene hypothesis. And so what they were able to show is that where there used to be two pieces of DNA, like this B1 and this J2, that were separate in the before situation, when we get to after, they're together as one piece of DNA. This hypothesis also predicted that there would be some DNA that was excised or removed and thrown out. So you can see that this also shows a circular piece of DNA that's been thrown out um, of the chromosome. And when Tonegawa looked, he could find the circles of DNA in the cell. Uh, under a microscope. These are actual pieces of DNA excised um, from those developing B cells. Um, and so that sort of allowed uh, him to understand that um, this mini gene hypothesis of combining small gene segments was the way that we were able to solve this problem of different types of um, diversity for antibodies. Um, so this is kind of showing you this um, in a uh, sort of more detail. When we are thinking about heavy chains of antibodies, heavy chains are made up of three different uh, segments combining. They're called a B or variable segment a D or diversity segment, and a joining segment, or J, which goes together with our constant region. 
Um, you will note that in the future, like on Wednesday, and on the problem set, I call this process VDJ recombination because we're putting together V, D, and J. And recombination is a term for cutting and pasting DNA. Um, the V segment that the cell chooses um, encodes amino acids about 1 to 101. The D segment that the cell chooses um, encodes about amino acids 102 to 106. And the J segment encodes about 107 to 123. And then the constant region encodes the rest of the antibody. So the V, D, and J are all sort of in this variable region. The rest is encoded by the constant region. Yep. Um, what does the J stand for you? Uh, joining. Um, with the light chain, there is also a separate recombination that happens. With the light chain, we just have a V segment and a J segment, as well as a constant region further downstream. So when we make a light chain, we do VJ recombination. Um, in the light chain, the V segments are encoded by amino acids 1 through 97, or encode amino acids 1 through 97, while J encodes around 98 to 110. Um, and then there's a constant region. So again, here we're talking about just this variable region that's being made up by the V and the J. The constant region makes up the rest of the antibody. Um, so you can kind of see this um, example here as well. So first I'm just going to focus on the heavy chain locus that's shown here. So what you can notice is that for the heavy chain locus, you have 40 choices for a V mini gene. my excellent restaurant menu anymore. So we've got 40 choices for V. And we have 23 choices for D. And we have six choices for J. So how many different heavy chains can we make? You could do the multiplying. I, I don't have the test for this. Hmm? Maybe Glandu? I can't hear you, so. Maybe Glandu. How many hundred? Glandu. 100? 12. 1200? Um, 8,640. 8,640? That sounds closer. You make 8,640 proteins out of 69 genes. And I got that just by adding these two numbers. So I got 69 genes and I have 8,000 proteins. Combinatorial diversity thing really helped me save on genes. For the light chain, we have two different choices. We actually have a light chain called lambda and a light chain called kappa. We'll deal with what's different between lambda and kappa later. But for lambda, we have 30 Bs. And yeah, 30 Bs, and we have four Js. So there's 120 lambdas. For kappa, we have 35 Bs and 5 Js. I can't do that one in my head as easily. 175, I think. So in total, we have 295 light teams. <laughs> which means that we can actually make 
this many heavy chains times this many light chains. How many, um, what's that total number again? The, um, I misplaced one of the numbers. Yeah. It's actually 5,520. Okay. Five, five, no? Yes. Okay. I'm not gonna like ask you these specific numbers. I'm showing you this as an idea. So I'm not, whatever. <laughs> the idea here is I'm trying to show you how much you can kind of buy out of combining many genes. So then you multiply those together. Anybody want to tell us what the number is? making different antibodies. Um, this shows that those uh, loci are, are on different chromosomes in your genome. Um, you can see chromosome 14 for the heavy chain. The two different late chains are on chromosome 2 and chromosome 22. And one of the other things that is um, really important here is that each V region has a promoter um, that is upstream of it before the DNA has been rearranged, before we've cut and paste the DNA. That promoter is a really long way from other regulatory elements that are down by the, um, the constant region. There's no way that RNA polymerase could transcribe this whole thing. This is gigantic. However, when we cut out all the DNA in the middle, suddenly this promoter and this enhancer are really close together, and that allows us to be able to get transcription. So sometimes people are like, well, why can't you take the whole, why doesn't the sperm cell just transcribe the whole big long thing and give you a whole big long RNA? Um, and it's just not possible. Um, partially because it's just too long and partially because this promoter and this enhancer are just too far apart. And it's only when you cut out all that unneeded DNA in the middle that any of this will um, become possible. We're going to continue talking about um, some details of VDJ recombination um, and uh, kind of why, how it's important and why it's important uh, next time. But we are going to spend um, a fair amount of time going into specific enzymes and their functions. There will be a point where I am drawing sequence on the board. Um, so uh, Wednesday is going to definitely be a very molecular uh, day. Um, so just be ready for that. And I will see you guys on Wednesday. Remember the inquisitive assignment due by five.